Thanks to Westerheim for inviting me to speak. It was really a pleasure to be able to see the entire collection of Hardanger fiddles that Westerheim holds um, for the first time and to think about it and to be able to pre present it to you tonight. But first, um, before we get to the pictures of the Hardanger fiddles, I wanted to talk about the living tradition that is um, exists around the Hardanger fiddle and the people who play it and the people who dance to it. So Andrew, could you um, switch slides, please? So um, tunes are, are taught. Um, the Hardanger fiddle uh, stretches back to medieval times and uh, tunes have been taught by ear from fiddler to fiddler ever since then. So it's a re really unique living tradition um, that exists in Norway and now in the United States and other parts of the world as people continue to play these instruments. On the next slide, you'll get to um, hear the music itself. So on, we're going to play a video of um, Leifrig uh, playing a Huldraslot. A, a Huldra is a mythical, seductive woman who um, lives in the wilderness in Norway, and the tune evokes that feeling of the wilderness. And uh, here's Leifrig. <laughs> So on the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about how the Hardanger fiddle is used um, in tradition and today. Um, there are several uses for it in the wedding. Um, uh, there were there are Hardanger fiddle tunes to play while the bride's getting ready for the wedding, and then tunes to play as there's a procession from the bride's home to the church. This wedding procession happened in Wisconsin in 2012. Some of you may recognize the driver of the cart as Phil Oden, who's a beloved teacher at Vesterheim and a carver in Wisconsin. It was his son who was getting married and a Hardanger fiddler led the way in the cart with him. When the party arrived at the church though, the fiddler had to stay outside. Uh, the fiddles were considered instruments of the devil and so in the past weren't allowed in the church. Nowadays they are, but they weren't in the past. And then uh, the wedding would continue with dancing and feasting and there were, the fiddler would play for the dancing and there were even tunes to play the next morning after people had been dancing all night long and were tired and hungry when they sat down to eat the first meal of the day as the sun was beginning to rise. So um, there are lots of important roles for the Hardanger fiddle to play in the wedding. On the next slide, um, on the next slide is actually a video we're going to show of dance music um, and a group of dancers um, dancing to that music of Valdra Springer, which is a dance unique to Valdris in rural Norway, and it has a repeated asymmetric rhythm. <laughs> So 
So there's a Valdra Springer. Um, in uh, Hardanger fiddles were used in, in rural Norway and um, in people's homes where the fiddler would sit in the corner and play for dances. But in the um, 1900s, it became popular to have um, folk music logs that danced together and performed at national folk music festivals. And that one was from Lans Koplik. So on the screen now you see um, three instruments. The one in the middle is a violin for reference because a lot of people have seen a violin, but not everyone has seen Hardanger fiddles. Um, they can be, the fiddle on the left is a Hardanger fiddle from Baldrus, Norway from about 1820. And on the right is one from Telemark, Norway from about 1955. The um, Hardanger fiddles have m much more decoration than violins and the decoration is unique to the the fiddle makers the fiddle makers have to know a lot of skills they carve the bodies but they also do uh, ink drawing on the body and inlay on the fingerboard and create the design so um, there are a lot of um, different skills that the hardanger fiddle maker uses so on these instruments you can see the fingerboards decorated on the left with paint and on the right, it's shell and bone inlaid into ebony. So on the next slide, um, you may have noticed on the previous slide that um, Hardanger fiddles have more pegs than violins. That's because they have more strings than violins. And um, the extra string, they have four strings that you play on with a bow like a violin, but there are extra strings that run uh, under, through the fingerboard or through the bridge and under the fingerboard and you never play those directly but as you play the top strings those bottom strings are tuned to begin to resonate and make sound and so it creates a, a sound to the instrument that with extra resonance that's very different from the sound of a violin the um before 1900 you could have between one and eight under strings, but since then fiddle makers have mainly made the instruments with four or five. So you should be able to see those four extra strings on this fiddle. Also look at the beautiful rosing that the black ink line drawing that's on the body of this instrument. On the next slide, you can see a little bit more um, that the rosing continues on the sides of the instruments. It's also on the backs and the back of the peg box. On the next slide, um, I wanted you to look at the sound holes of the instrument. So the violin is in the middle again, and you can see that the sound hole is rather flat. The wood on both sides of the S are, um, is in the same plane. Whereas in the Hardanger fiddle, the uh, sound holes are carved so that the wood overlaps and there's a, a big opening that points out toward the side and influences the sound of the instrument. On the next slide, you can see that um, the instruments are different sizes, so they can be smaller than a violin or larger than a violin. Um, the older instruments, like on the left, have very high arching on the bottoms and the tops of the fiddle, whereas as time passed, um, the Hardanger fiddles became more violin-like and had more shallow arching. They, are, they do have shorter string lengths than a violin, and they're tuned differently than a violin. So, um, and different strings can be tuned to different notes. So um, the music that's produced is, um, has its own unique sound. Next slide. On the end of the peg box, there are four main um, things that are used. On the left is a scroll, like a violin, but uh, each fiddle maker has their own way of carving that scroll. And this one on the left is really tight. Next to that is a woman's head. And in the third slide is a grima or a, a, a grotesque animal figure. Um, those were used early on. And then after about 1800, people started using a crowned lion from the, um, from the crest of Norway. And often the tongue was sticking out from the lion's mouth. So on the next slide, 
Um, you may ask, how old are Hardanger fiddles? Well, the, um, on the bottom of this picture is the oldest Hardanger fiddle in Norway. It was made in 1651 and it resides currently in the University Museum in Bergen. Um, I was lucky to see it in person when um, a friend of mine brought an instrument he found in North Dakota to compare to it. And that instrument in North Dakota has an older date than the one in Norway. So we, um, so this is the oldest dated fiddle. And on the next slide, you can see um, a case with the date of 1512. So there are cases that exist with dates older than the oldest fiddle. And it's quite likely that there were fiddles made before 1651, but um, they no longer exist. But this case from 1512 um, exists in Voss Folk Museum. On the next page is a map. Um, Hardanger fiddles were first made in Western Norway around Botnen, where um, there's a red dot on the map. And then um, they continued to be made there for about 100 years before um, fiddle makers on the eastern side of Norway started to produce fiddles. So um, geographically, they were, um, it was hard to travel between the two areas and it took some time for the knowledge from the west to spread east and then be developed in the east. So Vesterheim has fiddles from all of the places on the map that are marked. So now we're going to start looking at these fiddles. On the next slide um, is a fiddle in the Vesterheim collection with a label that says Anders Heldahl, um, a violin maker in Bergen, 1865. Um, it has uh, very little line drawing on the body, a woman on the end of the peg box, and the fingerboard has bone uh, that's engraved and overlaid onto a softer piece of wood. In the right corner, uh, right lower corner, you can see two bridges. The left one is a violin bridge, so it has nothing to do with the Hardanger fiddle. The one on the right is an older style Hardanger fiddle bridge. And um, the, the strings run through the middle of it. And those two black bars that you see in the middle of the bridge actually have jagged edges. And um, you can imagine when you have strings running through um, under the fingerboard of an instrument, they have to be set at the right level so that they don't bang and make, um, so that they can ring freely and make beautiful sounds. And those jagged edges on that part of the bridge allow the fiddler to adjust the height of the strings. Bridges aren't made that way anymore, but it certainly seemed like a great way to do it in the past. So um, the interesting thing about Anders Heldahl is that um, he made fiddles in an old form, like you see here, and he repaired a lot of fiddles. And um, it's really hard to tell where the, when he repaired instruments where the old fiddle stopped and where his work began. And in the case of this instrument on the left in, Vesterheim, in Vesterheim's collection, I really think it's um, Anders Haldel was not the original maker. I think it was made by Isaac Skor at Botnen in um, Western Norway about 1700. So on the right, you see an instrument in a museum in Norway with a very similar woman's head and the body shape is very similar. Um, very, um, it doesn't have much uh, ink drawing on it except for the lines around the edge. Um, so I think it's quite likely that this fiddle in the Vesterheim collection is um, an early Isaac score fiddle. Fiddles were first made in um, this area of Norway and um, Isaac Botnen made about a thousand instruments of which only 20 are left. So a lot of instruments were destroyed over the years. Um, the, Isaac sold these at high prices at markets around Norway and um, he became one of the wealthiest people in Western Norway. So he was very successful at building fiddles and making instruments that people wanted to play. On the next slide, you can see another instrument from West Vesterheim. Um, this one is not labeled, 
so I have to look at um, the look at the fiddle and decide based on um, a few things where and when it was made. It was not uncommon for fiddle makers, or it was very common for fiddle makers not to sign their fiddles in Western Norway in the 1700s. Um, Norway was under the rule of Denmark and um, Denmark impose, imposed taxes on, um, on people creating handcrafts. And um, it, but it was very hard for them to enforce the taxes in rural Norway because it was hard to get there. And um, so the fiddle makers put these fiddles out into the world and people bought them and the people imposing taxes didn't know who made them because they didn't have labels in them. So um, this one uh, doesn't have a label, but to me it looks like it's from Western Norway because it has pine on the top of it. And there was a lot more pine in Western Norway um, than there was in Eastern Norway where they were more likely to use spruce. Also the tailpiece that you see in the middle has a geometric design in it that's um, more similar to things done in Western Norway. It's um, a veneer, veneer of bone and a horn or a dark wood over a softer wood and the bone is engraved um, as you see there. The fingerboard on the instrument would have been similar to the tailpiece but um, the, the veneer has been lost in the instrument in the museum. On the right, you can see the, um, the peg box and the pegs are typical for a hardanger fiddle. They are made of a soft wood, a fruit wood that's overlaid with bone and then inscribed with circles. And the circles were meant to um, confuse evil spirits or things that might do someone harm. So on the next slide is uh, another fiddle from Western Norway. This was made by Ole Olsen Thaler Vis in 1869. Um, it has a body that's bigger than the ones we've seen previously that were made earlier. Um, it um, has a bone over a soft wood for the tailpiece and fingerboard and this time the engraving is of a circular rose design. And then that design is repeated in the the inking and the, the rosing on the top of the fiddle. So you can see how the shape um, is, is different between different makers and how over time it started, uh, the fiddle started to get larger. The next slide um, has a label in it, um, John N. Saibo from Vik and was made in 1893. Uh, it's, it's smaller and reminiscent of earlier fiddles. So by 1893, um, many people were building fiddles that looked more like um, modern violins, but in Western Norway, some people continued to produce instruments like this that looked older. It has a bone, um, a bone tailpiece and a geometric fingerboard and then a scroll on the end of the peg box. And I was intrigued to see the, the whimsical tree design that the, the fiddle maker chose to use for the rosing design on the top. On the next slide um, is an instrument that is um, more modern looking than the ones I've shown you previously. It was made by Andreas Nielsen Huvik. Uh, who was born in 1855 and died in 1964, had a good long life. And um, when I look at this instrument, I see it as a, a more modern instrument because um, it, it's using ebony for the tailpiece. So earlier makers didn't have access to ebony, but um, when they did get access to ebony, they started to use it more frequently for the fingerboard and tailpiece. And then instead of having a veneer, of the design, um, they created the design by inlaying shell and bone into the ebony. Also looking at the rosing, it, um, it, it's influenced, it looks like a Viking design. It has knots in it. It's different from other designs we've seen. And there was a national romantic movement that happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s in Norway, Norway that saw the revival of a lot of Viking designs, and I see that in this fiddle. 
So with that, we've um, that is a review of the fiddles from West Western Norway in the Vesterheim collection. And now I want to go to Eastern Norway. So um, fiddle making um, occurred in the West for a good 100 years before people started making hardanger fiddles in the East. And um, there was a family in the East that that um, made fiddles in Norway and Wisconsin for the next 150 years. And all the members shown on this family tree for the Helens and Steinchen Dollins were fiddle makers. On the next slide, you can see red circles around all of the makers who have fiddles in the Vesterheim collection. So there's really a great representation um, of fiddles from this family and important fiddles and um, in the Vesterheim collection. So that was really fun to see. So we're going to start first with um, the next slide. Um, this is a fiddle made by John Erickson Helland. Um, he was born in 1790. He wasn't the first person in Telemark to make fiddles. Um, there were four fiddle makers before him, and he probably learned from two of those. And he also uh, was a prisoner of war, war in the early 1800s um, with some uh, fiddle, some violin makers from other countries, and he may have learned from them as well. And he returned to Telemark and um, started making fiddles. This is one of his um, in the Vesterheim collection. It um, uh, it uh, having the fiddle in a box in this condition is gives me a great opportunity to talk about construction techniques. Old fiddles like this are not as stable as modern fiddles. They d modern fiddles have blocks of wood at the corners and the tailpiece and the neck um, that stabilize the form of the instrument. And then the sides of an instrument are made from bent pieces of wood, and those. Um, sides are about a millimeter and a half thick. So they're, they're very thin. And if you imagine gluing a piece of wood onto one that's very thin, um, you can see that it would be difficult to keep those joints together. On modern instruments, there's an extra laminate of wood that runs along the bottom and the top that makes um, that edge thicker to about four millimeters. So then those edges are more stable. So these um, old instruments are hard to keep together and keep playable. On the next slide, um, you can see uh, on the, the, the fingerboard and tailpiece back by white are the Vesterheim um, from the Vesterheim fiddle. And then the ones on the gray are in a museum in Telemark in Norway. This is also a John Erickson Helland fiddle. And um, to me, it was quite remarkable how similar the fingerboard and tail pieces were on this instrument in Norway to the one that's in Vesterheim. Um, because the, the fingerboards and tail pieces look different, like they almost might come from different instruments, but um, it was clearly done this way. The fingerboards have bone down the center and shell inlaid along the side. They're really similar, but not exactly the same, showing you how the maker switches up what he does from fiddle to fiddle and um, and the tailpiece has what I'm going to call an eight petal rose um, that is used on both of those and and is different from the the way the fingerboard is made and also notice that the fiddle in the collection in Telemark is in a similar condition to the one at Vesterheim. They're just really hard to keep together and in playable condition. So on the next slide, we're going to go to the next generation uh, in the Helen Steinchendalen family. And this is an instrument made by Eilif Johnson Steinchendalen in 1865 in the Vesterheim collection. So um, the body is starting to become a bit wider as time has passed. And the fingerboard has that eight petal rose and uh, the veneer over a softer wood. In the next slide, you can see um, the fiddle from the Vesterheim collection on the right and the fiddle in the Norwegian Museum on the left, also made by Eilif Johnson Steinchendalen. They both have rosing where um, there's acanthus uh, leaves 
emanating from the edges of the fiddle and similar central roses, but, um, but slight variations from fiddle to fiddle. Uh, the fingerboards both feature the eight petal rose, but the one on the left has much more variation in it. So <laughs> I'm driving home the point that um, each fiddle is unique and that the fiddle maker has to have a lot of skills and, um, and creates this art. On the next slide, um, we're going to go to the next generation of um, fiddle makers in the Helen Steinchen Dolan uh, family. Um, this is Knut Eilison Steinchen Dolan. He was the son of the man who made the fiddle in the previous slide. This fiddle was made in 1886. Um, I forgot to mention that the Steinchen Dolan name came um, so the, the initial uh, person in the family tree had the last name Helen, but um, when the Steinchen Dolan, um, when the son left the farm and lived at the farm called Steinchen Dolan, he took that as his last name. So that's how we have two names in this family tree. So this is another um, son who lived on the Steinchen Dolan farm and created this instrument. You can see that the body again is widening out and the top and the bottom are not as arched as in the um, earlier instruments made in Western Norway. On the next slide, we can take a closer look at this instrument and you can see the beautiful line drawing on the body. I um, really like to look at these instruments and study the way that inking is done and look at how the lines move from thin to thick to thin and how precisely placed the dots are and, and the parallel lines in the cross hatching. Um, also look at the fingerboard. It's missing the bone that would have been at the end of it and it's missing some of the shell along the edge. Um, so we, you get a better idea about what I'm talking about when I mentioned that there's a goat horn and shell and bone veneer over a softer wood. And then the eight petal rose here is again done in a different variation. So back in the next slide, back on the Helen farm, um, there were three sons, or there were uh, two sons that were making fiddles. And then um, the first son died and uh, there was a man who was, um, his name was, Uh, he was born Gunnar Olaf Haugen, and he married um, a daughter on the Helen farm and moved to the Helen farm. And he and another son, Knut, Helen uh, bought the farm and made uh, Hardanger fiddles together there. So um, this is a, a fiddle um, by Gunnar Olsen Helen um, made on the Helen farm um, in the third generation. You see the, the, the eight petal rose is continuing to evolve into these triangles and the body um, is, is again becoming more violin-like. In the next slide, you see um, the fiddle made by Gunnar Olsen and John, John Eilifson side by side. Um, they, um, they have similar body shapes and, um, the eight petal rows you can see on both of the, of the instruments and, um, but with variations and, um, it's the, uh, so fiddles were being built on the Helen farm and fiddles were being built on the Steinchen Dolan farm. And then they were taken to markets together where they were sold, um, to people. Uh, who were interested in buying them. So now we're going to go to the fourth generation of the Helen Steinchen Dolan family. On the left is a fiddle made by Olaf Gun uh, Gunnarsson Helland. He um, was the oldest son of Gunnar Olsen Helland, and he learned fiddle making from his father at a very young age. His first fiddle is dated um, to 1887 when he was just 12 years old. Um, 
So he moved off the farm when he was 21 to Notteden in Norway and bought a shop on the town square. Um, he built fiddles there and in 1915 he ordered, he opened a music shop in the front room and um, along the street. So he made fiddles in the workshop in the back and he sold radios and records and um, music and other instruments, guitars and accordions from the mu music shop along the street. He also had a bu business selling bonds and securities and um, was one of the first people in Nottedin to own a car, but he still um, remained focused on his fiddle building and took the instruments to the next level of, um, of uh, craftsmanship. Um, learning from uh, generations before him. On the right is a fiddle made by the Helen brothers in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin in 1906. Um, so um, Knut, Gunner, um, Knut Gunnarsson Helen immigrated to Chippewa Falls um, in 1903. And his brother, Gunnar Gunnarsson, followed him in 1905. And together they set up Helen Brothers, uh, the Helen um, Brothers in Chippewa Falls um, on the street there, and um, continued to produce fiddles um, in Wisconsin for, um, for immigrants that lived here. Unfortunately, Knut died in uh, 1919 when he was just 39 years old, and Gunnar um, kept the shop in Chippewa Falls open until 1927, at which time he moved to Minneapolis and worked for a violin maker there, and then on to Fargo, North Dakota, where he um, opened Helen Music Company and uh, continued to work there until 1976. Unfortunately, um, he built his last fiddle in 19, Hardanger fiddle in 1937. So in the United States, um, there had been, uh, the immigrant population was aging. Um, there was a decline in interest in the instruments and, and he just stopped building them. In Norway, there was a decline as well um, as the instruments were seen as a remnant of a distant, um, uh, uh, as a, dis a distant um, rural past and the music was considered kind of barbaric and just not something that city folks wanted to keep participating in. But in Norway, um, people continued to build instruments and, and some people continued to play. And in that fourth generation of the Helen Steinschendalen uh, family, uh, Knut Knutsen Steichendalen was building until the 1960s. And the fiddle that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, um, in when I was comparing the two Hardanger fiddles to violin, the violin that was made by Knut Knutsen Steichendalen in Norway in 1955. But um, back to these, um, these two instruments, one made in Norway and one made in uh, the U.S. You see, they're really similar. Um, the how, the eight-petal rose now is um, taken on a different form, and they're both using a similar um, a similar design for that. The one on the left, I really puzzled me when I first saw it because it has a scroll at the end of the peg box, and I'd never seen an Olaf G. Helen fiddle with a scroll on it instead of the li the crowned lion. And then I looked at the catalog notes and I saw that it um, it was in the collection of Otto Rindelschbacher and he um, repaired instruments. So it's highly likely that he replaced the original lion with the scroll that you see there. On the next slide, you can um, see the back of the fiddle made in Wisconsin. Um, earlier I talked about fiddle makers using the woods that they had at hand. And um, the back of this fiddle has bird's eye maple um, found in this country and not so common on fiddles in Norway. You also see the um, beautiful rosing on the back of the fiddle. The next slide is um, just for fun, a picture of Knut and Gun Gunnar in front of their shop in Chippewa Falls. So this last generation of the Helen Steinschendalen family really took instruments to the highest level. And to this day, um, performers um, really uh, 
they're the instruments that people want to want to have as performance instruments and um, are highly sought after in Norway and the United States. So that's why it's so great that Vesterheim has examples of them so that um, people like me who build instruments and are looking uh, for inspiration um, can study the instruments in the Vesterheim collection. So on the next page, next slide, um, there these instruments are also in the Westerheim collection. There are a whole lot of um, Hardanger fiddle enthusiasts who um, have built built fiddles. Um, they haven't had the same training as um, the Helen family um, gave each other, but um, they uh, continue to build in the same tradition. The one on the left was made by um, Ben Larsen Brekka. Um, he was a Norwegian immigrant to Chicago and um, when he was 17 years old. And when he retired, he moved to Madison um, in his 70s. And after that time, he made 57 fiddles before dying at the age of 93. He gave fiddles to his family and to um, in both the United States and um, Norway. So this one, um, you can see it doesn't have a decorated fiddle uh, fingerboard or tailpiece. It does have the rosing and um, it's just not as finely made as the, the instruments that we saw in the previous slide. The one on the right was made by Otto Rinlischbacher. He was um, born to a Swiss family in Wisconsin and owned a tavern in Rice Lake. So he's the one that worked on the Olaf G. Helen fiddle that I showed previously. And um, this is an instrument that he made himself. On the next slide, you can see that he um, showed his own artistry by um, creating a new form of the crowned lion um, and uh, his own rosing with uh, holly leaves. And along the side of the instrument are images of dancing devils. <laughs> So um, kind of reflecting on the fiddle being considered the instrument of the devil. So to this day, people continue to build fiddle, Hardanger fiddles in um, Norway and the United States. And um, I'm one of those people. So Vesterheim asked me to show a few of my fiddles and uh, talk about uh, the inspiration for those. This one um, is called Fornis Brunen. Uh, Fornus Brunin was a heroic, um, a big heroic horse that lived during the time of the plague in the Middle Ages and um, moved bodies from the village of Mostrand to the church in Rowland for burial. It has a fingerboard um, inspired by Viking designs and then uh, the woman on the end of the peg box um, represents uh, the the woman who brought the plague to Norway or was uh, said to have brought the plague to Norway. On the next slide, you can see um, that the woman was said to have come out of the mountains with black hair and had a book uh, with the names of the people that she was going to take. And then uh, on the uh, sides of the fiddle, I tell the story of the horse um, taking the, the bodies back and forth. The next slide shows um, the village of Mostrand emptying out and um, for inspiration for what the village might look like as it's emptying out or as the horse is taking the bodies for burial, um, I looked to pictures that were sent from my Norwegian ancestors to immigrants in the family who came to Wisconsin. So these pictures were taken in the early 1900s and I used them as inspiration for the drawings on the side of my fiddle. On the next slide you can see um, the church in Rowland that exists today and the monument to the great horse Fornus Brunen. So uh, in the Rosing on My Fiddles I like to tell stories that re relate to Norwegian tradition and heritage. The next slide um, shows my friend Carolyn and her mom. Uh, Carolyn wears a Voss Bunad. I was um, cheering for her as she stitched the scout on her headpiece. 
Um, she, um, as she was stitching it, she studied a Westerheim scout that was in, uh, on display at Liv's Risa in Stoughton. And then when I was in Vos, she, she, um, my assignment was to figure out how they actually keep the thing on your head. So there's actually a structure under that. So on the next slide, um, you can see how I use Carolyn and her scout as inspiration for this fiddle that I'm building. Um, I put the her on the end of the peg box and then the fingerboard and tailpiece have designs inspired by that embroidery. The next slide shows um, inspiration for a fiddle from um, Hollingdahl. The woman on the left was my first hard on her fiddle teacher and she's an American who lives in Hollingdahl and um, she wears a, a bunad, the traditional clothes from Hollingdahl. And I found it fun that uh, there's a traditional hairstyle with a pom-pom on top and a tassel out the back and a bonnet and then frizzed out hair. So I took images like this and used them to create um, what you see in the next slide, um, which is a fiddle with um, a tailpiece and fingerboard um, with designs inspired by the embroidery on the Hollandal Bunad and then the woman on the end of the peg box with the Hollingdahl hairstyle. So with that, um, I want to, we're going to get to some questions, but first I want to thank Vesterheim for um, keeping these fiddles for us so that those of us who are interested can um, study them and learn from them. And also thank Vesterheim for um, continuing to promote the living tradition that are, is around Hardanger Fiddles. They have monthly music jams and they've had courses um, where people can learn to play the Hardanger Fiddle um, as part of their folk school. So thanks to Vesterheim. On behalf of Vesterheim, I think I, I can say for everybody on the call, thank you, Karen. This was just fabulous. There, You are a wealth of knowledge and we are so lucky. If anybody has questions, you are welcome to pop them in the chat. Um, it can be questions about specific images that you saw, specific fiddles or other things that have bubbled up to the top of your mind as you've been listening to Karen share. Well, I'll start off, Karen. I have a I have a question because you know I, I work a little bit with the with the objects here at the museum and you know, just thinking about how you uh, make, but also decorate the, the pieces. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the inking, the rosing and how that works. And, you know, how, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, it really is unique to Hard on Your Fiddles. Um, so, um, so it, it um, it's done with uh, India ink and um, I use a pen tip and dip into an ink well and draw on the instrument. The um, thing is you can't draw on the raw wood um, because if you do that the ink will <laughs> spread out so there have to be a, a few layers of finish on before you do the drawing on the instrument and then um, and then more layers on top so that the ink doesn't wear off over time. Um, all right, Andrew, I wondered if you could go back to slide 20. We just had a had a question there, thanks. I just wanted to look up the date for that one, but I didn't remember what the number is. So let me see if I have a date for that one, maybe somewhere here in my notes, possibly, unless Karen finds hers quicker than I do. <laughs> well, the, the maker died in about um, 1965 or 64, so, I'm not exactly sure what, when this one was made. Um, I'd say our notes say 1910. That um, it does make sense because I was talking about the motifs being typical of the national romanticism that was popular at the time mm -hmm. and the, the Viking motifs. So um, we have a question here about how many hours or how long does it take for you to create an instrument? Because there's just so much detail and design work that goes into that. Yeah, I've never actually um, written down <laughs> all the time. It um, takes me, the, I worked with Sigvald Rorling in, um, 
in Norway at Ole Bull Academy. He's a master fitter, fiddle builder, and he says it takes him uh, 440 hours to build a hardanger fiddle. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it they they were made at a time when uh, created at a time when people had more time for things like this and um, valued what the the craft of the fiddle maker. So um, so they are very labor intensive. There are um, some people now using um, modern uh, CNC machines to try and make them faster than in the past. So um, cutting down on the time spent carving by using a computer um, guided router. But uh, Sigvald estimated that even with the CNC machine, it takes 200 hours to build a hardanger fiddle because there's you can't um, mechanize everything about it. Wow. Well, Eden said that she loves um, how creative and imaginative you are with your designs. She asks, why do you think that the old or original makers were less um, out of the box creative and stuck to sort of these variations on a theme? Hmm. I think, um, yeah, they are variations on a theme, um, but but they are variations. So most of the older makers that I've seen um, weren't creating the same thing over and over again. Um, they would make variations on that eight petaled rose or um, slight variations on the rosing. I know today a lot of um, there are fiddle makers that do create the same thing over and over again. And I feel like they do that because the um, people that are buying the fiddles are looking for a specific look that they think a hard on your fiddle should look like. But um, as you start to look at um, more historic instruments, you do see that there's a lot more variation than um, what people tend to make today. So, um, um, Jeannie's wondering if it's possible to convert a regular violin into a hardanger fiddle, or how would you, I guess, begin to make a hardanger fiddle? Um, well, so um, as I said, with a violin, the string length is longer than a hardanger fiddle. So um, you have to deal with that first. Um, and there are people that convert violins into hardanger fiddles. There, um, you can, the F holes are different. So you can have a hardanger fiddle with violin F holes, but if you want to have the, the sound of the hardanger fiddle, you're gonna have to make a new top for that violin with the overlapping F holes. Um, and then you'll need to make a new neck that's um, shorter with a longer peg box. So because there are more strings, you need to have that longer peg box where you can have more pegs in it. Um, there are makers that are trying to produce instruments um, that um, more, they call them student model instruments um, that cost them less to produce and they'll buy violin bodies from China and uh, carve their own necks and, um, and then use those to make hard on your fiddles. Um, and it's certainly possible to do that. And Drew has a question that I that I hope I can answer um, and asks, has Westerheim considered restoring the more restorable of instruments into playable condition so that they could be played? And if not, what is the reasoning behind that? Well, I'm glad that you asked that, Drew. Um, Karen and I were having a little discussion about that as we were we were preparing. Uh, for this this conversation tonight. And um, so yes, we have considered restoring uh, instruments. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging. It, um, some of them are not in really stellar condition, I think, as especially some of those that uh, were completely falling apart. So it does, you know, it does take money. Um, it also takes resources to keep them up for um, in a playable sort of condition. And so we haven't, um, so we haven't done that at, at this point, but we have um, been talking about that just, and with a number of, of things, because museums are always struggling with um, sort of that uh, 
thoughts or, or how you interpret things if you don't use them because originally they were meant to you know be played or to be used and so that's always sort of a um a, a conversation that museums are, are always having of how to best interpret them but um we're fortunate that there are other people too who are who are restoring them, who are making them, um, who are playing them too. And so um, we're looking to a lot of folks like, uh, you know, like that out there too, who make those things accessible for people um, as well. So yeah, so it's something, you know, that we're having conversations about. And we, um, I, if I recall in the past, we've had conversations about that with the Hard Hunger Fiddle Association um, as well. Um, of how to, you know, support that, uh, but um, yeah, so it's sort of an ongoing conversation. But if you have some, um, you know, some ideas for folks we could contact or, you know, um, continue the conversation with, we'd love to to be able to do that. And it's a, um, like Jennifer said, different museums have different philosophies on that. And I've had experience with the museums in Norway and some will restore their instruments so that they're playable and they'll allow people to use them for concerts. And um, and the old instruments do have a different sound than the new ones. So it's it's really fun to be able to, to hear those, but other instruments and other museums in Norway feel like any kind of use like that um, degrades the instrument. And so they don't allow um, any uh, restoration to happen. So I kind of, um, I appreciate that Vesterheim has things in original condition there for, um, for study. Yeah, it's always, it's always a, a negotiation, isn't it, uh, Karen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see, Josh was asking what the maker, the name of the maker from Rice Lake, Wisconsin, and was his connection, what was his connection to the brothers in, in Chippewa Falls? So that was um, Otto yeah, Rindlisbacher, Otto correct? Otto Rindlisbacher, yeah. So I only know what's in the Vesterheim catalog. I'm not sure if you know more than I do, Jennifer, but um, it, it was written that he did know the Helens in Chippewa Falls, um, but um uh remember uh that uh, Canute died in uh, 1919 and that Gunner left town in 1927 so um, I'm not sure how long their friendship continued after that and Otto Rindlisbacher lived um, much later into the 1900s so um it is written that he was um uh fan of the Helen brothers and that he did know them. Right. Yeah, I don't I don't know much. Uh, I don't know that I can add much to it, except that Otto was doing restoration work and he was also making various instruments, not um, and other sort of Norwegian uh, instruments. I think we have a um, Salmodican and maybe a longa like that he he made um, as well in the collection. There's kind of some interesting interesting thing. So Swiss, not Norwegian, but kind of taking those those traditions on himself. Uh, let's see. Mary wants to know how you get the curve on the top. Uh, so um, it's carved. So you start, um, so the top is actually made of two pieces of wood um, split out of a piece of um, pine or spruce. So you need a straight grain wood and um, it's um, like you imagine firewood it starts out as a triangle and you split it down the middle and glue the um, the thick sides together so it's two pieces of wood and um, and then you carve the outer shape of the instrument and um, once the outer shape is carved you flip it over and scoop out the inside and um, yeah, so it's it's carving. It's not at all bent um, on the top or the bottom of the fiddle. The sides are bent. So I told you the sides were about a millimeter and a half thick, and those are bent with steam on a hot um, bending iron. Karen, do you happen to know? Um, it seems that men were historically making these these fiddles. Were do you know of any women, or is is that just a new newer uh, thing that's happening. 
Yeah, when I started to build fiddles in 2008, um, uh, people um, indicated that there weren't any women who were building before and they wondered whether I would be accepted or not. And um, But then I went to Norway and um, to show fiddle makers there my fiddles and I didn't know what kind of reception I would get. And they're actually very welcoming. And they said, of course, women can build fiddles. And um, so um, in Norway, there was a woman at Valder's Folk Museum who's made fiddles. Sigvald's older daughter had made a fiddle. Um, and now the head of um, the workshop at Ole Bull Academy is Wiebke Luders, uh, a woman from uh, Germany originally. So there aren't very many women building fiddles, um, and it wasn't um, something that women did in the past, but currently now um, women are doing it and accepted. All right. We have so I many. Have time for one or two more questions. One or one or two more qu uh, questions. Wow. I was wondering, um, someone was wondering here if um, what makes the the Helland or the, um, what was the name again? Stein? Stein Schindalen. Yep, Stein Schindalen. Uh, but what makes them so wonderful to, to play or so coveted to, to have to be able to play? Um, they, well, the tone is very good. The um, the craftsmanship is excellent. The rosing is beautiful. Um, but I think for musicians, it, it comes down to the tone and um, just they're really special, <laughs> special instruments. And one more here. Um, Anne says, you mentioned that the tuning differs from a standard violin. So what pitches are used for the top uh, four strings? And then do you need to purchase special strings for both the top and the resonance strings underneath? So Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the, so there are at, at least 28 different ways to tune the top strings on a hard on your fiddle. And um, with those different tunings, it, um, you get different, different sounds and it evokes different moods. So um, the main tuning for a hardanger fiddle, which is used um, for most of the, the, the songs people play, um, is like a violin, but the top three strings are up a whole note. So a violin is tuned uh, from the lowest string, G, D, A, E. And the D string is up to an E on a hardanger fiddle. The A string is tuned to a B. And the E string is tuned to an F sharp. And the G string, which is the lowest string, is up to whole steps. So that's tuned to a B. The, um, it was um, common when hardanger fiddles were first being made in the Baroque time for violins to be, have their strings tuned to different notes. It's just um, that died out um, with um, modern violin music, but still continues to be used in hardanger fiddle music. And as for special strings, they're um, shorter than violin strings and um, different weights because of the pitches they're tuned to. And um, many of the strings for the hardanger fiddle are made from gut. So um, the place to get strings for a hardanger fiddle is from the Hardanger Fiddle Association of America. And um, the HFAA imports uh, hardanger fiddle strings from Norway that are sold. And I happen to be the merchandise manager, a uh, volunteer job for the Hardanger Fiddle Association of America. So I have a, the supply of strings for the organization in my house. And if you need them, I will send them to you. Well, thank you again, Karen. This has been just an absolute pleasure to spend the night learning from you. I feel like I could listen to you talk for hours and hours. This was just a real pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you.